Hi, it's Jan Beta, and today we are going to turn these parcels into something like this. At the very least, I'm going to try to achieve that goal today. We're going to see how it turns out. As you probably know, if you are following this stuff, Rob Taylor, who made the Commodore 64 60 clone boards as well, and I built one of those in a previous video, has made a replica board, that means a new PCB, according to the specifications of the Commodore VIC-20, or VC-20, as it is called here in Germany, for peculiar reasons. And he was kind enough to send me one, and then also Martin of the Run Stop Restore now sells full kits to populate these boards. And yeah, he sent me a full kit. We should be fine. We should have all the components to build our own VIC-20 today. So I'm pretty excited about this. Building the 60 clone board was incredibly fun. And as you've maybe seen in the video, it worked in the end. So uh, I hope for the best for this one. And yeah, first of all, let's see what we got. And this is obviously going to be quite some soldering. So if you are not up for that, I'm going to try to make it as entertaining and informative as possible. But yeah, it's going to be me soldering the board and then uh, connecting it up and trying it out, I guess. So yeah, let's see what's in the boxes or flat boxes. And by the way, obviously I'm going to link the stuff you see in the video description. Oh, oh, that's a 1541 board that uh, Rob also made. Okay, that's a Commodore 1541 disk drive replica board. That's pretty neat and it's yellow, nice. Okay, thank you for that bonus. <laughs> and here it is, the main attraction. So this is the Wiki 20. It's a replica of the second revision of the Wiki 20. I don't know if there were any more revisions. I, I just think there were two. The initial revision had some large voltage regulators on the board and the power supply was just an AC, nine volts AC power supply and the uh, voltages that provide the board with uh, the DC were generated on board. And this uses the Commodore 64 power supply. So it has five volts from the power supply, five volts DC and nine volts AC. And the AC is rectified on here as well and used for some bits similar to what the Commodore 64 does. This also has some chips cost reduced away, but overall this is the better version of the VIC-20 because you don't have the huge voltage regulators on board that generate a lot of heat naturally. So yeah, pretty cool that uh, Rob replicated this board revision, not the other one. Also, this has less components, less to solder, and uh, it's easier to build. This should also be a bit easier to build than the Commodore 64 one because yeah, basically the VIC-20 is a more basic computer. So there's less stuff going on here. And then I got two from Martijn from the Netherlands who provides uh, kits for the clone boards of all kinds in the meantime. Oh, and I got some sweets in there. Nice. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. Okay. And I think this is the whole kit. It should be the whole kit with all the stuff we need. And we have a bill of materials that tells us where the components go. So I'm going to go by that, I guess. And uh, just mark whenever I solder something in, which should be relatively easy. Unfortunately, there's no parts finder website or anything like that for the Wiki 20 yet. Maybe somebody is going to make one eventually, but yeah, this looks pretty neat. And in the other package, there's uh, something that Martin, he's still always looking for better components and things like that. Oh, and there's some, <laughs> there's some bonus, I think, chewing gum. 
Commodore branded chewing gum. Not everything we sell is mint. <laughs> and this is a, a voltage, uh, a, a rectifier that fits the board better that uh, Martin sent. He didn't have these when he sent the other one. And there should be one in here that fits, but this one fits better. So we're going to use this one. Let me interrupt this briefly to thank the sponsor for today's video, which is PCBWay, my favorite manufacturer of prototype PCBs of all kinds. They have their fourth PCB design contest going on currently, where you can send in your PCB designs and win some very generous prizes. They have some categories this time around, which include IoT, robotics, and there's of course always a free category where you can just do whatever you like and send in your designs. I highly recommend checking out the website, whether you want to participate in the contest or not, you can still order your PCBs there and they have excellent quality, obviously. So check out the link in the video description and we are going to return to building the VIC-20 now. I am just turning on my soldering iron, I guess. And we don't need too many tools for this. I have my trusty side cutters here and a good soldering iron my trusty old soldering iron that is and we have all the parts in the kit and we need some good ventilation so i have a little fan here with a, a carbon filter in it that is my soldering fume extractor my self-made diy model just an old pc fan and i also I'm going to keep the window open, which is always a good idea, and have another fan blowing air out of the window. So the ventilation should be pretty good, which is always a good idea if you are soldering a lot. And I tend to use these whenever I have like something like this, like a whole board to build, I'm using uh, good ventilation. So apologies for any background noises you might hear. That's because I don't want to die in the solar fumes. <laughs> it's always a good idea to start with the lowest components. So I think what I want to do is to start with the resistors and then go on to the components that have a taller, uh, that protrude taller because it's easier to get them in place uh, after you solar the lower components. Yeah. And thankfully, Martin also provided the color codes because I don't know them. Yeah, I always have to look those up for the resistor values. They are coded with uh, colored rings, obviously, and they are all listed on the bill of materials here. So it shouldn't be a big issue to find the resistors we need. The position is uh, the board ID, which is signified by the silk screen on the board. So these should be easy to find. Not quite as easy as with the parts locator you saw me using in the Commodore 64 build video, but yeah, this is going to be reasonably fine, I guess. So let's go. So there's our R14 and as you can maybe see, the values for the components are also printed on the circuit board, so that's really handy. Uh, if you don't get a kit, you can just choose the correct resistors and capacitors and stuff like that from your parts bin, maybe. And no worries, I'm not going to bother you for every little resistor. Uh, I'm bending the legs outward so it holds, it holds in place. Obviously there are holders for these things and uh, better ways of doing this, but this is the way I'm used to doing things like this. So this is the way I'm going to progress through this build, hopefully. I think it would make sense to populate more than one resistor at a time for this to save some time. Just wanted to show this for the first one. And now I'm going to do all the other ones. And I'm probably, it's a good idea to uh, tick these whenever I put one in. Some of these have a smaller footprint than you would usually have for a resistor that is in an actual 
orientation, so you have to put them in something like this, like standing upright, just bending the leg over there. And for the most part, the numbering of the little components is they are they are very close together if they have similar numbers in the similar number range. So it is not that difficult to find them usually. So <laughs> we're going to see about that. Okay, here's a bit of a soldering tutorial. Basically, you heat the component leg and the uh, circuit board and then you add the solder and you leave it on for a second or two so it can flow through the via there and uh, make contact on the other side as well. Okay, that's all the resistors done. Ta da! <laughs> On to some of the ceramic capacitors, I guess. So here's a little bag with uh, 26 <laughs> ceramic capacitors that have uh, 104 printed on them, which means 100 nanofarad. So, yeah, these are going to go all over the board, so I'm just going to go with these first. Ah, uh, and then the other ceramic capacitors also. That's going to be fun. Okay, that's all the 104 ceramic capacitors done, all 26 of them. And they are also marked on the silk screen with a little 104 and some rounded corners around the component footprint printed on the silk screen there. For these little ceramic capacitors, you can also see the values listed here, including the numbers that are actually printed on the capacitors. And yeah, basically it's a a uh, three-digit number with the last digit uh, signifying the number of zeros, basically. So 10 is 0.1 microfarad or 100 nanofarad. Uh, 103 is 10 nanofarads. 102 is 1 nanofarad. 224 would be 0.22 microfarad. And these uh, don't have a polarity, so you can put them either way too, like the resistors. I encountered a peculiar thing. There is one optional little ceramic capacitor that is to be placed over R5, this resistor here, in case the machine doesn't start up. Everybody on the forums and such thinks that it has to do with uh, UB9, different types of this 7402 chip require this. 
but we are going to leave it out for now and we are going to go on with soldering this 220 pico ferret i believe uh actual ceramic <laughs> which is c13 here so this is going like this then we have two higher voltage film capacitors that are 220 nanofarad <laughs> or 0.22 microfarad each and these are rated for 100 volts so uh, they go into C35 and C36 you probably don't want to get these confused with uh, ceramic capacitors or something like that So, tantalum capacitors, although they look nearly the same sometimes as the ceramic ones, they have a polarity. And uh, in contrast to the electrolytic capacitors that some of you might be very familiar with, these have the positive side marked. The electrolytic capacitors have the negative side marked. So there's a little, uh, I don't know if you can see it on camera very well, but there's a little marking and the lag is longer. That's the positive side. Uh, you can mostly go by the rule long lag positive for these components. For electrolytic capacitors that's also true. But yeah, these are just, these are the opposite polarity marked than for electrolytic capacitors. Yeah, I just wanted to point that out quickly. So we're going to put these in. And we have four of those, I think. That's not too many. And the, the markings are the same as on the uh, ceramic capacitors. So, 225 means 2.2 microfarad. Okay, so this two-legged capacitor is going into this three-hole position, C4. And uh, the outer holes are both positive, while the center hole is negative. So I'm going to put the long leg in one of those outer holes and the short leg goes in the center. There we go. And we are going to do the other tantalum capacitors accordingly. And for C5, which is this one, uh, the C5 designator is not really printed on the board. It's just half printed because there's uh, the exposed golden contact there. So yeah, that's C5. That's where that goes. And that's the same story with the three holes, uh, two of which are positive. Okay, now for the electrolytic capacitors. We have three very tiny ones which are 10 microfarad ones, 16 volts. And uh, yeah, as I said, these have the negative side marked, but the long leg is still the positive one. So yeah, the marking is the negative side and the long leg is the positive side. So keep that in mind. And there should be a little plus on each little location where one of those goes. So let's put them in. And we have a huge radial electrolytic that goes in this position, 2,200 2, microfarads. And that is uh, the direction of the arrow here points at the negative end. And yeah, the other one is the positive end, obviously. And we have a little trimmer capacitor that goes in the C48 position, which is here. And a variable resistor that goes into the R10 position here, which has three holes. And these are for setting the video timings, I believe. 
so if everything looks good, you don't have to fiddle with these. Now for the next bag, which is the socket kit. These are dual leaf, uh, that means these have these leaf contacts that grab the pin of the chips from both sides. I actually prefer the turned pin sockets, the round ones, because in my experience they make even uh, they make a tighter connection there and uh, the chips don't necessarily fall out on their own ever again. However, if you want to replace chips a couple of times, these are the better choice in my opinion. Commodore famously used the very cheap ones, which only have uh, one side grabbing, so it's uh, single leaf sockets, and those famously don't make good contact and uh, lead to a lot of errors and uh, faults that are pretty difficult to diagnose at times because yeah, it's just a, a wonky contact on one pin on a chip and you are there alone with your oscilloscope or your multimeter and uh, yeah, it gets me every time. <laughs> But these are all new parts, so we shouldn't run into any issues. And also, these are the dual leaf variant, which are much less likely to fail at all, if ever. And I'm just going to do this, these one by one to make sure that they sit flush with the board. You obviously want to put these in, in the correct orientation, so you can see, uh, without seeing the, the silk screen, which direction the chips go. And these have, usually, there are several different uh, models of these, obviously. These usually have a little notch on one end where pin 1 is located. And uh, there's also a little notch indicated on the silk screen. So this should go in here like so. And yeah, you're good to go. Of course, you can put these in the wrong way around, but that's going to be more confusing when you put in the chips later. I'm always holding the socket from the flip side of the board, in this case the front side really, <laughs> and then I'm soldering uh, one pin this side and the diagonal pin on this side so it stays in place. I'm just using some solder that I uh, got on my soldering iron here. And then I go in and solder all the other pins properly. So it stays, just so it stays in place and flush with the board correctly. And you could of course do the sockets as your first step, because these are really low profile. You can just put all the sockets in, basically turn it around and solder, because they are going to be, you can just lay it flat on the table, and the sockets are all going to stay in place. So it's probably a good idea to do that first. By the way, I've set the soldering iron to around 370 degrees Celsius. That's my preferred temperature. Uh, yeah, Probably you have your own preferred temperature. It varies a bit from person to person. I like to solder pretty quickly. Sometimes leads to rather sloppy solder joints. But I found that this temperature is ideal for me.
So, I think that's all the sockets in. Uh, now for some of the other components. There's a couple of small components left, like these uh, ferrite beads and some transistors. And we also have a rectifier. And then we have the connectors. These are going to go in last, I think. But yeah, and then after that we are going to populate the sockets and see if it actually works. So now for the smaller components. I'm not going to go into much detail about these. They are all basically, the locations are all listed here and on the board. So there's not going to be much trouble, I hope. And some of these in this uh, compartment are standing upright, just like the resistors we did before. So nothing, same, same procedure basically. But at this point, we've done that, seen it. And maybe we got good at it. <laughs> And the last one goes here. It doesn't have the designator printed here, but I double checked with a VIC-20 and this is where the final ferrite bead goes. Right next to the VIC chip. Next up, we have these inductors. They actually look a lot like resistors, but have a green package usually. These are just small inductors and they go in the positions that say L1 and L2 on the board. And they, the color codes are also listed in the bill of materials, so we won't run into any issues there. And these don't have a polarity. Next up we have CR1, which is a 6.8 volts Zener diode. And yeah, the peculiar thing about Zener diodes is that they only let a certain voltage pass, so they are used for voltage regulation usually. And that's what this is for in the VIC-20 as well. So we are going to put this in and go on. This goes here. And the polarity is marked by a little ring on the diode itself and by a little stripe on the circuit board here, so it should go in like so. All in all, this is quite some effort, but it's pretty easy if you have your bill of materials and all the components in a kit. You can, of course, source the components yourself. Most of these are really common parts, so you shouldn't run into many issues. And there are, like, uh, the bill of materials is available. So this is the crystal oscillator. It says, uh, says the frequency on there. And of course you need different ones uh, in case you want to run this in uh, PAL or NTSC mode. This is a PAL crystal with 4.433619 megahertz frequency. And these are just uh, generating like a sine wave kind of close to a sine wave to provide the system with a general clock. And in case of the VIC-20 and also the Commodore 64, the clock is very closely related to the video standard and PAL and NTSC have slightly different clocks. So you need a different crystal for each one. This is a choke. And basically it's an inductor and it's a dual choke. It has four legs and yeah. This doesn't go in like so. It goes in like this or the other way around, but it doesn't matter because it's the same inductance on both sides, I believe. Hopefully, <laughs> I think so. 
So this is the, I think the final component, uh, apart from the connectors. This is a bridge rectifier and it goes here in these four holes. And the positive, which is marked on the bridge rectifier goes this way. So the uh, square marked thingy there, hole via, is where the positive goes. And I'm going to stand this off slightly from the board because it provides a tiny bit of airflow because these components can get rather warm in use. Okay, let's get to the connectors. I'm going to start with the uh, keyboard and LED connectors, which are just these pin headers, because I think they have the lowest profile. And then I'm going to gradually work my way up. And this is not particularly difficult because uh, each connector only fits in a particular spot. <laughs> and also, of course, we have an on-off switch. I'm not going to talk about this that much. Uh, just going to solder in the components and show you the results. And I think that's actually all the soldering done. Neat. Okay, so we now have a spanking new VIC-20 circuit board with all the passive components populated and some transistors. Uh, and we are going to populate all the chip sockets. And we don't want to forget the fuse because otherwise we won't have much fun with this. Populating the chips if you have a full set provided, like I do, uh, it shouldn't be. It's just a matter of picking and placing the correct chips for each socket here. And I'm just going to do that. There's all the designators are printed on the silk screen on the board. And we also have them on the list, obviously. But this should be pretty straightforward. And we actually have two separate kits here for the custom chips and for the RAM and logic. Let's see. Usually what I do is to bend these pins slightly inwards using my ESD mat here. And of course, inserting the chips, I'm using my ESD strap to not damage any of the chips. Um, RAM is pretty prone to failure if you shock it. <laughs> and also some of the custom chips are pretty uh, sensitive, of course. Of course, they are old chips. And take your time with these steps because uh, basically you want to orient the chips in the correct orientation. There's always a notch or at least a dot that indicates the orientation where the notch is on the circuit board. Insert them fully. Be very careful to not damage any pins or bend them so they don't make contact. I'm going to try my best here. I usually end up inserting a chip the wrong way, at least, if I do something like this, but we're going to see. And of course, I managed to bend a leg. And obviously, the board itself should be cleaned before doing this. I'm doing this now because I forgot. I'm a tad confused. And you should, of course, inspect 
the back side of the board for like broken solder joints or bridges. I'm just using isopropyl alcohol here to clean off the worst of the solder residue. And you want to look for stray solder blobs. Trust me, it's going to happen. You are going, if you're doing so much soldering, you often get some little blobs there inside it. And you can usually, if they are just sitting on the solder mask, you can usually just scratch them off with your fingernail. So I've inspected this board thoroughly and obviously the last bit we have to put in is the fuse. And <laughs> that's easier said than done. These uh, fuse holders are a bit bendy, so maybe you have to bend them into shape a bit, like I do. Especially if you manage to solder them in at a slight angle, like I did. But this should provide contact. And now we are ready to test this, actually, I think. Uh, I'm going to hook up my Commodore 64 uh, five pin DIN monitor cable here and uh, also my Commodore 64 self-made power supply which I trust. If you don't trust your power supply you want to of course make sure that the voltages are correct before you try to power this up because the power supplies, uh, yeah, we talked about that. The Commodore 64 and WIC-20 power supplies are basically the same for this model. The older models uh, have a different power supply, like an AC power supply and have all the voltage regulators on board. This one doesn't have any voltage regulation on board except for that Zener diode and the yeah, if you want to call it voltage regulation, it's not really regulated, it's unregulated. Uh, the voltage coming from the bridge rectifier and the rectification here. But, uh, yeah, there's basically not too much that can go wrong if the power supply is good with this board. So we're just going to give it a shot, I guess, and see. Yeah, maybe this just works right off the bat. Cross your fingers, please. Uh, maybe this blows up, maybe something worse happens, I'm not sure. We're going to see. I'm going to turn this on now. Yes! <laughs> it works right away. That's kind of cool for a change. It works, it just works. And even the, the picture looks pretty crisp, actually. I am, however, going to try to tweak the little uh, trimmer capacitor and trimmer resistor. So the little trimmer resistor is for tuning the picture output level. And the capacitor is for uh, adjusting the sink. So if you have color issues, you want to adjust the little capacitor a little bit. And if you have uh, like a dim, dim picture or other issues, you want to adjust the resistor a bit. But it looks pretty crisp already. Let me show you a close-up of the picture while I twiddle with these. So I have no idea how well this translates through the camera, but I'm just going to trim the little resistor a bit. And as you can see, yeah, we even can make the picture a whole lot clearer, actually. The, uh, like the jail bars are completely gone now. Let's try and tweak the little capacitor a bit. That doesn't do nothing, really. Yeah, it's actually looking really good. This works <laughs> right away, which is amazing. And yeah, I'm going to hook up a joystick and a keyboard, which actually is the same keyboard matrix as the Commodore 64. In fact, it's the very same keyboard they used for both machines. So um, yeah, this is the keyboard connector. I'm just going to hook up a Commodore 64 keyboard temporarily, and I'm going to hook up a standard Atari-style 9-pin joystick and see if we can do some stuff with this and try it out.
Yes! It does work. That's pretty nice. So, I'm now going to connect my uh, Pen Ultimate Plus cartridge from the Future Wars 8 bit, uh, which I can highly recommend. Nice online shop for all things retro computery with a bit of a focus on uh, Commodore stuff and also some Spectrum stuff. And yeah, it's, it's really very well made products as far as I can see and also nice people running the shop. Penultimate Plus cartridge is, uh, yeah, it's, it's basically the best thing you can use with your VIC-20 in my opinion. So it has plenty of games on there. All the memory expansions that you would ever want are built in. Very easy menu system you're going to see. Yeah, unfortunately I don't have a spare VIC-20 case. As you can see, we have our cartridge here and we can just play some games, I guess. Let's play some Gorf, maybe. This just seems to work very, very well, actually. Ooh. Yeah, that's it for this video. I got a working VIC-20 that I just built myself. It certainly took a couple of hours, so uh, if you want to do something like this, set aside some time. Uh, but it's well worth the effort just to build a working system. And uh, with the kits that are available and the nice circuit boards that are available, this is just, it's not that difficult to build actually. And as you've seen, it worked right away, even if I usually don't manage to uh, pull that off. <laughs> I hope this was helpful. I hope uh, to see you again on this channel. Thank you to everybody who supports me. And also big thanks to everybody who subscribes to this channel. I'm Jan Beta. Thanks for watching. See you next time. Bye.